Right, let's see, could you about like this? Hello, listeners. We are so close. How's that camera over there look, pal? We just need to move him this way. Uh, yeah, Gara, there you go. Everybody stay right where they're at. No mics are blocked. No stands are blocked. Looks good. Looks good. Free show. Uh -oh, we got a little... Uh, the Viagra thing going, thing, thing going there. Well, well, no, that's not Viagra, man. <laughs> it would be the exact opposite. Of How do we? We uh, can do. If you want to switch, we can move. You can take that mic, and I can move go, this one over. Totally up to you. I think it worked. Give me a little piece of tape. Give me your tape. A piece of tape. Your tape box thing. Oh. You're fine. Got a promo first, then the intro. I can't. I can't. I don't even want to know what you're doing that the microphone right now. Are those of the host and guests and not necessarily those of the staff or management? That's not working there, Mike. Hi, I'm Paul Marshall Longo. I'm a serial entrepreneur. You want to switch it? Yeah, let's do it real quickly. Uh, take, take this. Set that down. Right over there. Pull it over. Right here. Pull it over. Excellent. Pull it over. Excellent. Everybody still in the shot for 10 seconds to the intro. Everybody's in. Everybody, the shot's in. Everybody's in shot. Good. Okay, stand by. Here we go. Say hello to all our listeners. Hello, all our listeners. Yeah, for sure. Three, two, three, and five. And now, live from Las Vegas, Nevada, coming in at six foot one and weighing in at your guess is as good as ours. <laughs> Our host, of Get Up Rip, is this radio. Two breaks this show. Two. Two. Okay. That's awesome. And stand by. Mics are live. Good afternoon. Welcome, Las Vegas, to the Paul Montalongo Get a Grip Business Show. This is where the American Free Enterprise System is encouraged. It's uh, endorsed, and it's hard at work this afternoon. This is where serial entrepreneurship is a way of life. We talk about what's real, what's profitable, and works. I uh, am joined by my co-host, Harry E. Shade. Welcome, Harry, this afternoon. Good afternoon, Paul. How the heck are you? Glad to have you here. This is KLAV 1230, the talk of Las Vegas, and it's another kind of steamy day in the Vegas, in the Vegas Valley here. Uh, I am your serial entrepreneur host, Paul Montalongo. You can listen to the show live streaming on Al Gore's Internet by simply going to paulmontalongolive.com. It's that easy. Once he checks it out, he filters it through his office. He endorses it. Al Gore, that is, and you can certainly see it live at paulmontalongolive.com. Follow the show at Paul Montalongo Fan on Facebook and on Twitter at Paul Montalongo. Of course, you can call the uh, show here at 866-820-5528 or locally at 731-1230. In studio today, as I said, is Harry E. Shade. Now, Harry, today we've got a great program. Uh, we're going to be talking about health care, the health care issue, uh, Obamacare, and that might seem like a little bit of a political departure from what we normally uh, speak about yeah. uh, in terms of the entrepreneurial world and free enterprise. And at the same time, we're going to learn from our expert guests how it really, really does affect employers um, in, in the free enterprise system, what they need to do to prepare for this, some things that employers like myself are thinking about uh, in terms of how we can work with the system or work the system depends on how you uh, you put it you know mm -hmm. so uh, we've got an expert coming in, in a few minutes uh, actually he's right there to he's, my left he's you're watching there. live yeah. he's over there raise your hand Mark. <laughs> Robert Wagner um, but first you know um, that that begs the question about health and fitness in the workplace and what that looks like and how as employers we can keep our employees or contribute or participate with our employees in being healthier, uh, fit. Because I mean, as you know, there's no, there's no debate that right. healthy, fit, happy employees translates into so much for the employer in terms of benefits. You know, yeah. Uh, the uh, 
profitability goes up. I mean, anytime an employee misses, there's that costs the employer money. Well, yeah, it affects the bottom line. It's a, it's a perfect subject as, as part of what we're going to talk about today because, you know, as an entrepreneur, one of the things that you're looking at is your bottom line, you know, a cost and things along those lines. Uh, you know, are your employees being productive like you're talking about? And the more that we, you know, we can talk about those types of subjects and get people really interested in, you know, making sure that they have a healthy environment for their employees uh, to make them happier, absolutely. Perfect topic to talk about when we're talking entrepreneurship. Absolutely. So I thought about ways that we as employers and uh, members of the free enterprise system can contribute to a work environment, a place that has healthy employees. And so I made a couple of notes, and I know you've got some things you can contribute to that. First of all, I think as an employer, we need to encourage health and fitness. We need to encourage fitness programs. Uh, we need to, uh, I, I mean, I know that uh, employers can go make arrangements with fitness clubs for discounts for their employees. Right. Yep. Right? Yep, that's one way of doing it. Another one, you know, is just simply giving them information or providing incentives. You know, again, it drives insurance costs down. You know, health insurance is another big issue when it comes to employees, things like that, and we're going to talk about that later, but it will drive those costs down if you have employees that say that they're smokers, um, and you can get them off that, or if they're overweight, and you can help them lose the weight. All those things are going to contribute in so many different ways, but it also shows, and I'm going to say this, and I know you're going to, it shows you care about your employees. You care about that. I know, what a concept, right? What a concept. So. Uh, actually, actually, that's very true. So you can bring in health experts, Yep. you know, to do consultations, or to do short seminars, to give information to your employees. Um, don't overwork your employees. Now, as an employer, that's always there's always a fine line there because typically free enterprise entrepreneur people are hardworking, demanding, yep. you know, work from sunup to sundown type individuals, and because they expect that of themselves, they typically expect that of their employees. Understanding that as a as an employer that really wants to do right by his, his or her employees. Uh, there, there's a balance there between working your employees hard right. and working them efficiently and then overworking them. And so, you know, we strive to have a balanced life. We want our employees to have a balanced life as well. Right. And the other thing I, I noticed you had on here too is having healthy kitchens or vending areas. You bet. That's really important. In fact, that's what a booming area in vending, as a matter of fact, right now is providing those types of healthy alternatives and snacks and things like that, you know, for your employees rather than everything that's laden with all the sugar. And, you know, there's people out there that are actually making a very good living providing that type of service. Absolutely. And I think the biggest thing that an employer can do in the workplace is to lead by example. Absolutely. So as a business person, as a leader, if we're fit, if we take care of ourselves, if we, yeah, that too, if we, if we you know, set the example of, living a healthy life, then I think our employees uh, will follow. But much, they'll follow much more than they will if, you know, they look to us as leaders and say, well, they're not doing it. What, you know, what good is it for me to do it? Well, basic form of leadership. We talked about Absolutely. that before several weeks ago is be the example. So, you know, it, it's really tough if you're sitting there smoking on a cigarette and you're overweight by 100 pounds and you're looking at your staff and going, you need to lose weight and quit smoking. Sorry, it's not going to really get them motivated to do that. Do it yourself. Be the example. It's a perfect. It was perfect, Paul. I'm, I'm really impressed with, right. your, with your list. There. You like that? Yeah, I did. And that takes us to our first guest, our our, our guest today. Oh, our guest is it. Robert Wagner. Now, why don't you introduce Robert to our listeners, and then we'll get into this matter of the healthcare system. Absolutely. Well, Rob, he was born and raised in Vegas. Right there, that makes Rob special. Which, I mean, it's got to be like what 10 percent of the entire population not many, in Vegas. Not many. Yeah, not many like that. He is known as an enrolled agent. What does that mean? It means he is even special in that way because he's not just a CPA, CPA on the state level. This man, this man over here, the guy you see next to us, federal level, enrolled agent. Okay, so he's he's up there, licensed by the Department of Treasury, no less. He's also the president, we have a president here, Good. of the Nevada chapter of the National Association of Tax Professionals, otherwise known as Nat put or something like that. Nat, Nat. So, but no. Rob, welcome to the show. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. Yeah, Rob, glad to have you here. So this, this, uh, this whole matter of affordable health care, the Affordable Health Care Act. Um, I, I think there's a lot of misconception about it. I think there's, I know that there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. Right. So why don't you give us like 
the basic overview of what it is, where it started, you know, when it begins to take effect, and then we'll then we'll get into some other questions I have about it. Yeah, there's probably eight or nine different deadlines depending on how big you are as an employer, how many you know, how many people you employ, and are you an employee? There's all kinds of different ways to to, to really kind of look at the, the different deadlines and and what's going to come up next. Now, the other thing is the IRS. We say that it's an affordable health care act. The IRS about six weeks ago issued 600 pages of regulation Friday night at 5:30. Wow. Yeah, I made mean, it, it uh, for a single guy in Vegas. You know that that made my weekend really exciting. Oh wow. 600 pages of regulation they released on just defining the one word affordable. Just the definition of affordable. Just, just to define affordable. I, I hate to ask this question, but I'm going to go there. All right. Oh, here we so, go. with 600 pages of description, definition, hmm. what is it? How is it defined? What did they come down to? In affordable a nutshell, is defined as eight percent of an individual's income, but no more than nine and a half percent of a family's income. So, if you have two employers, then the one employer cannot charge either one of the taxpayers more than nine and a half percent of the total family income. Rob, that's why we have guys like you, right? Because that just absolutely, I, 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 you lost me after the first time. But it's it's wow. eight eight percent of the employee while they're in your employ. Eight percent of the individual employees. Individual, income. but not more than nine and a half of the family income. Right. Okay. So hmm. this, of course, makes me think: How in the world is an employer going to know your family income? Unless you disclose that to them voluntarily, and how authentic is that? Well, if you violate the nine and a half percent rule, there's a two thousand per employee penalty for that. And mm -hmm. how are you? How is the employer going to know the uh, the family income? You're not. You're not. There's no system in place right now that the employer can know the entire family's income. When does all this take effect, by the way? January first, twenty fourteen. Things start to go into place. Now, if you're a large employer, more than fifty employees, it starts January of twenty fifteen. They just extended it, and when they did that extension, a lot of people misinterpreted that and thought they extended the entire Obamacare. What? Yeah, right. What is what is uh, the the act? How does the act define the size of an employer? Well, it defines the size of the employer by the amount of employees it has. So, uh, zero to twenty-five is a certain class of employees who qualify for certain credits. Um, zero to forty-nine, you're a small employer. Uh, Fifty to fit to ninety-nine, you're a medium-level employer, and hundred above, you have a different set of rules. You're a large employer. Now let's say you know you're a serial entrepreneur like yourself. You have one parent corporation that owns, say, four sub corporations. If you have 25 employees in each sub corporation, would qualify as 100 employee. So they're taking the total, the composite number of employees under your corporate umbrella. Yeah, the total owned by the corporate umbrella. Okay. So a lot of companies were were doing what they call splitting. They were breaking off smaller corporations and saying. Okay, we don't want to have more than 25 employees, so they put 24 employees under each corporation. Well, the IRS, what they're doing is they're able to track that based on your tax volumes, and, <laughs> and they, they add the numbers up and they put it together, and now you fall by the uh, 100 employee rule. Let's back up for just a second. Uh, I'm an employee, say, all right. Uh, what's the benefit to me, the employee, to to be with an employer that you know has to um, uh, you know, comply with the Health Care Act. Well, it's going to be a lot better if you're an employee that has to because you're going to get a, a level of coverage that covers 10 basic needs to find on healthcare.gov. And those 10 basic needs for health coverage is, is what exactly this Affordable Care Act was about. We wanted to make sure there was a certain standard of care or a certain standard of insurance that was offered by larger employers. What are those 10 points, you, you know? Off the top of my head? Yeah. Yes. What, yeah, what, what are the main, what's the gist of those ten points? Let me ask you this way: what, What's the difference in those ten points and regular private healthcare group you well, know, coverage? Those ten points actually define the basic healthcare needs of what the, this particular Congress has determined meet the needs of an average American right now. Oh, I see. So it's more generic than a very specific, say, Blue Cross. Well, yeah. Policy. And realistically. The, the ten points, if you read them, yeah. they are lower standard of care than what's currently being offered by 95 percent of the employers. So, is it going to cost an employer less than, say, buying into a group policy for, with Blue Cross Blue Shield? Well, it's going to cost the employer more because now 
the insurance companies, you know, see an opportunity because it's required. So they're going to raise the premiums. Now, if an, if an employee does not use 85% of the premiums in health care, the health care, the uh, premiums get refunded back to the employer or the amount that they pay. Huh. Now, I, just a really quick question. You know, there's been a lot of talk about this having just an absolutely devastating effect on small business and entrepreneurs. Is, yes. is that really going to be the case? Yes. Think it is. Yes. The, the cost of the health insurance itself, because it's now required, it, it will double, triple, some say 10 times what the current health insurance is going to cost the, the small employer rate. Because it's mandatory. Yeah. Because it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. Um, what's the what are the what do you think is the most important aspect that an employer needs to consider right now before January one, uh, two thousand and fourteen, to be able to, you know, fit into this program? If let's say let's go with the, let's start with the smallest employers that are twenty five employees. If you average paying your employees less than fifty thousand dollars a year, and you cover their health care more than fifty percent of it. And you pay you pay more than fifty percent of the premium, then you qualify for a credit to get up to thirty five percent of the money you put out back on your tax return. So, in addition to that, that credit is refundable, meaning if you don't have a tax liability, you're actually going to get money back by giving health coverage to your employees if you have under twenty five employees. On January 1, twenty fourteen, that number goes from thirty five percent to fifty percent for small employees for small employers. Now, yeah, go ahead. Oh, and, 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 uh, the problem is, if you have more than 25 employees, what's the benefit to covering your, your employees when a lot of times you can pay the $2,000 per employee penalty and they can go to the state and they can get their own insurance? The challenge with that, I see, is from a, you know, it really puts an employer, someone in the free enterprise system, puts their back up against the wall because if you don't offer your employees health benefits, number one, you're not competitive as an employer in recruiting employees. Sure. Number two, you have employees that are less happy, that are discontent, because mm -hmm. they don't have that security of the health benefit plan. Now, what's the number one problem entrepreneurs face? The bottom line, right? Right. Exactly. And if you're looking at, you know, coming out of pocket $4,500 a year per employee, or if you're looking at coming out of pocket and paying a $2,000 penalty, what are you going to choose? Well, you choose the two thousand dollar penalty if you're if you're only looking at dollars in the bottom line. Right. Now the first thirty employees don't count. Okay. Towards that penalty. So then you look so as an employer, <laughs> a way to skin this cat mm, so is, as an employer. It, yeah, as an employer, a way to skin this cat is to keep your workforce force at twenty nine. Keep, keep your workforce at twenty nine or let's say you are that guy that has forty seven employees. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's two thousand times seventeen. It's going to be a lot cheaper than offering health care for 47 employees. And then they go out and get it from the state. And you've got to go out and get it from the state exchange. Okay. So in a moment, we're going to come back to the show, and we're going to talk more about how it affects um, employers, their penalties, you know, how, I mean, other ways that we see employers starting to try to circumvent this, you know, because there, there's always going to be those that try to figure out a way, right? There's always got to be a loophole. Okay. Yep. So we're going to talk about the loopholes here when we get back to the Paul Muffin Line. We'll get a great business show. Clear. Especially when they have 600 pages just to talk about a word. I'm sure there's a loophole in there, too. Yeah, we want to talk about, you know, the loopholes. Okay. You know, legitimate loopholes. And then, as well as the way to say, I'm a lawyer to the box out already. I'm a lawyer to the IRA. It's quite a scrupulous. I'm trying to find a win here. Soon, right by the employee, maybe in profit. There's a balance. We'll talk about the cost of tax payers. Because those uninsured employees, they go now to the state, those uninsured employees with the cost of state. We get a credit back if someone who provides it. There's a company that provides the insurance. They're contracted with the state. So there's 16 choices they have on the exchange.com. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. I know. How's that going to be disclosed? When it comes to understanding credit, you know, I'll just know it. 
That's why I don't want to as we speak today. So there's nothing that you really so that they have to tell you. They have to show you like this family package on your like that thing. I mean, again, we were talking a little bit about privacy last week. You know, I, I think that really is digging into somebody's you know, privacy. Um, so there's really just basically you just got to trust them to give you the right information. So, this is with 24 hour access to your account. Which is weird from last week I talked about early disclosure. Like that I didn't think. Uh, this, is, this is something that I don't think comes into play with my philosophy here. Ten seconds back to the bumper. All right. Way to go, Mike. Stand by. Can you do a photo? A couple of photos? Sure. Then. Maybe a video? Welcome back to the Paul Montalango Get a Grip Business Show. This is where the free American Free Enterprise System is encouraged, endorsed, and it's hard at work. We're talking with we're talking with Rob. <laughs> right, no, no, Rob Wagner. And I mean I'm just um this whole Obama health care issue, uh, I have I have such a range of emotions on it because I, I am such a firm believer in the free enterprise system and that privatization of just about anything can supersede supersede any kind of effect, effectiveness that the government can provide. And Healthcare is like at the almost at the top of my list in terms of what privatization and the private sector can provide for the economy because they manage it better, they price it better, they service it better. When you put this is this is my political rant, so it's my show, so I'm going to go with it here. Okay, when oh. you put when you put a product, good or service, out into the out into the uh, private sector, there's competition, and competition breeds so many good things. It breeds good pricing. It breeds great service. You know, it breeds more creativity in the products and goods and services. You said, uh, you said breeds better service? Breeds. Okay, and yeah. have you seen any, met any attorneys lately? <laughs> There's a ton of attorneys that well, have horrible service. I'm just but, saying. But you'll always find a good one. Yeah. You'll always find a good one. Yeah, you'll, they're, they're you'll always find a good insurance company. You'll always find a good gas station. You'll always find a good restaurant. You know, can you imagine those things being under the government umbrella in terms of operating those? It's like what restaurants, all the restaurants that I would not go to. Right, because of that. Having said that, I understand that health care, the Obamacare program, it is going to happen. I get that. So as an employer, I've now got to figure out a better way to manage my business, to retain my employees, to offer good products and uh, good services for my employees so that they in turn have a you know a great place to live, to work, you know, a thriving environment. So with the cost of business going up, you want to try to still provide a value. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. a whole new concept right there. Provide, provide a value, right? And, I mean, our employers, I mean, is the consensus out there that employers are going to have to raise their prices on their products and services to cover this? Uh, I would think so. Yeah, you, you almost have to. Yeah. With the cost of doing business going up, it's, it's almost a requirement. You know that there's a certain margin you have for profit, and there's a certain acceptable level where you can reduce that profit. But how far are the entrepreneurs out there going to reduce the profit to comply with Obamacare? And you know, is Obamacare here to stay? Well, that's I mean, the consensus is I think it's here to stay for a while. Yeah. You know, because this is this is his you know his hallmark policy. As most administrations have had some kind of hallmark policy, this is his, right? I mean, it's named after him, not officially, not formally, <laughs> right? No. But but it is his quote unquote legacy, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so we said that you said the employer is going to be penalized two thousand dollars per employee if uh, they do not comply with this. Is that the only penalty that they would face at this time? That's only that's the only penalty that the employers would face. Now the employees, if they don't get health care, they're also going to have to pay a penalty as well. Explain that. Well, there's a penalty that is going to go into place, and it's it's really geared on certain levels. There is a an entry level, and the further along we get into Obamacare, the higher that penalty becomes. Now, if a family of, just for instance, a family of four, two hundred thousand dollars a year uh, gross income, their penalty the first year is going to be one hundred and sixty-eight dollars. By twenty sixteen, that penalty is going to jump up to cap out at four hundred and fifty dollars, which is going to be the max penalty. 
Okay. Family income, two hundred thousand dollars. First year, one hundred sixty-eight dollar penalty. Yep. Hmm. Year four, you said what? Four, four. Year four. Year four, by the calculation, it should be sixteen hundred and fifty. But there's a cap on the penalty that makes it uh, caps it out at four hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. A real quick cool question I have in there because being a, being a veteran and, and, and really caring about veterans and their types of situations, they have access to like the VA. Right. Does that count for them? Is that yes. so that so they don't have to they not to be concerned about going on getting this health care because they have access to the VA. As long as it reaches the bronze level, bronze level three level of care, then they're not going to get penalized as veterans. Well, that could be a challenge. They're not penalized as veterans. How about the employer? Does the employer still have to provide? Um, insurance, or are they exempt from a veteran who has uh, their veterans' benefits? They haven't released that yet. Oh, <laughs> far into it. Yeah. Uh, we, we got 600 pages yet. defining affordable, but we yeah. can't decide whether or not what we're, what we're going to do with our veterans. They can't. They haven't decided what to do with veterans. I'm a, I'm a vet myself, and and I promise you what you said earlier about government running restaurants. I I couldn't agree more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So okay, so another way that I'm thinking as an employer, and I, I you know I have to think this all the way through, but that if I have employees, I've obviously got uh, you know payroll taxes to pay. I now have this you know this increased health care benefit that I have to pay. Uh, it might in some cases behoove me not to have employees, but to have the same workforce or the same work done by 1099 contractors, for whom I don't have to pay any of those mandatory. Things. That's an excellent point. Now, if you're going to convert all your W-2 employees over to 1099 contractors, what's going to end up happening is the IRS has sees every quarter you file with W-2 employees. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to get into a position where you're going to file as 1099 contractors, and they're going to want to know why. And there's four areas of control that you cannot exhibit to have to have a contractor. So if you tell that person what time to show up in the morning, right? if you exhibit any control as far as you know how they generate their income, you know, you produce the clients for them. You give them a desk and a computer and an office to work in. Now, do you require them to attend mandatory meetings? Behavior you give, control, yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you attend them to require training? Do you, do you give them an email, company email? Yeah, I think the IRS actually has a list of 21 different things. And if you do any of those, you could potentially have moved a person from 1099 over to W-2. And we don't I, even realize it. It's right. the simplest thing. Right. Because, I mean, and that, that's always been a, an issue for me in my businesses and because because it's like I want to give the individual independence, and at the same time there has to be accountability and manageability. Right. right. So, but, but back to your point, I want to finish up the point, and that, and that is if I have a group of employees now and I want to circumvent the Obamacare Health Act, and I move those employees over to 1099. I definitely see the red flag there. Absolutely. Right. But now going I'm, forward, though, rather than hire W2s, I hire 1099s. And you circle out the workforce. There's an average of 120 percent turnover here in Las Vegas, right? So within 12 months, you would have turned over everybody, gotten off the W2s, and had the 1099s replacing. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, if but I, you still have to watch out for that. How you treat the 1099 contract so that they don't. Uh, do any kind of work under an employee status. And, uh, here's the problem. The problem lies in when the IRS wants you to determine if those 1099 employees are really 1099 employees or not. If they are de deemed to be employees and not contractors, then I have all the back taxes, the penalties. You're going to pay all the back taxes. You're going to pay 100% of the employment taxes, which just went up to 16.3% this year. You're going to pay a 90% penalty on whatever that number ends up being. And you're going to be forced to uh, pay back all the withholding as if every employee withheld a single zero, the highest tax rate. Right. And then you'll, how about you, uh, you have to pay back the, uh, the back payments for the Obamacare health thing? That should be built in there, but they haven't, once again, they haven't got that. Oh, they yet. haven't got that. They will get that. They, they'll get that. Oh, that'll be job one on yeah. the next that'll be That'll come before the vets. Now, here's the other thing that, that's questionable right now. It's unconstitutional for the IRS to collect a penalty on behalf of Congress. I get that. It's unconstitutional. Mm. But, it's, it's, but you try challenging it. They right? are. Well, I, I know. I know the people IRS is challenging. They, they can't. They can't collect the penalty. Right. So um, they can. They can put it on your tax return. What they say this is the penalty. But yeah. the problem comes down to enforcement. Yeah, so we're on a public radio station here, so I don't want to piss off the uh, IRS, so I'm just going to go, <laughs> I pay my taxes. 
<laughs> right? I'm Kurt. Always have been. Always will be. Thank you, IRS. Leave me alone. Right? Did you see the wink, wink you did when he turned to me and said that? I, 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 I noticed that. Yeah. 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 No, it's true. But back to this 1099 issue, and that is, you know, uh, so so there's some uh, there's some responsibility on the part of the individual as well, the 1099 individual, right? Sure. Part of their prerequisite is that they have to at least be employable or hireable by other entities other than your own. Absolutely. So like I, if I'm a 1099 contractor, you know, I have three or four uh, customers, right? Or three or four vendors, if you will. That really then puts me in the 1099 classification. If I just do work just for you, right, and you're my only guy, and I act like a W-2, then I'm going to be classified as W-2 and encumber all those uh, uh, penalties that you just talked about, right? Yeah, and depending on how big it gets, uh, the good news is the penalties cap out at 250000 Oh, there, there you so, go. So, you know, there's, there's a, size a cap. For what size employer? Paul's got for all his employers. Back pocket. <laughs> for all employers? All employers. Well, again, then it's a risk-reward cost, cost of the cost thing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. If I have 100 employees, you know, I know it sounds funny to say $250,000 over, over 100 employees, is, that's not that much. It's a drop in the bucket. It's a right. drop in the bucket, so it could be you know, uh, a business decision. It's a, business, right. that's well, a financial business decision. Though. Rob, in your professional opinion, though, your expert opinion, is really this whole idea of taking your employees and making them all 10 9s or at least they collect or whatever? I would not tell any of my clients you would not. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm waxing it for, for the sake of conversation here, but I know for better that if you, you just, if they're 1099, they act as a 1099, you better treat them as a 1099. And classify them as a 1099 for W-2. Same thing. They've got to be treated as such with all the benefits. It's just there's you know, and then then you go out and do the other things that entrepreneurs do: better service, you know, new products, innovation, feed the market, charge a little bit more. All those things that entrepreneurs have been doing for years and years and years and years. That's the way that an entrepreneur has to handle that. We are a crafty bunch. <laughs> entrepreneurs. Okay. So um, the other thing I want to ask you is about the cost to. You know, we say that um, this is going to benefit the employees uh, with, with health care. It's even going to be beneficial to employees that are like not to take the health care. But at some point, it's just my gut sense, and I have to do the math on this, but it's my gut set sense that an act like the Health Care Reform Act is going to eventually, if it hasn't already, cost taxpayers more to support this kind of a program. Well, yeah, you're talking about when... The, the, when a taxpayer has to go to the exchange, they have to make that financial decision of what level of coverage are they going to get. Because you have gold, bronze, platinum, silver, right? And so you can choose any one of those four coverages, and inside those four levels of coverage, there's another four options to choose. So you get to really pick and choose and, and find the shoe that fits your financial budget. On average, the lower income taxpayers, the lower income public, uses health care seven and a half times more than a higher income individual. Hmm. Uses, uses the benefits of health care. Right. The they go to the doctor more. Yep, they go to the okay. doctor more. They're not as healthy. Yep. They're not as healthy because they're not high income earners. Yep. They're typically a lower educational uh, background. And you know, your different ethnicities and minorities and things like that start mixing in there. And it's a proven fact. They use doctors more and they pay less for health insurance. And, and this is just a statistic. Statistical proof, right? It's just right. Yeah, it's just a, that, it's yeah. statistical proof. It's not. Right. It's not like you know we want to pick on people who make less money. Right. It's just a fact. You know the people who make less money typically commit more tax fraud because they're changing their kids out. Oh, take my kid this year. You can claim their income credit. You get the ten thousand dollars refund. I got more than the three that they'll let me have. So you know, take Johnny. And we can do it. They start changing children. They then they go to the doctor more, and they're going to typically buy the cheaper level of health coverage on you. Exchange. What are the rules in this act about dependents? Coverage for dependents. All dependents must be covered and they're calculated into that penalty that we talked about earlier. The 168 that caps out at 450. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at this moment, an employer doesn't have to cover anyone, period. Right. And if they choose to cover someone, they can start with the very basics of just the employee, second period, right? <laughs> and then they have the choice to offer a bit of a benefit of dependents. Uh, to that employee, but you're saying in the Health Care Reform Act, Obamacare, that dependents are going to be covered courtesy of the employer. Dependents count as a half of a person when you're calculating the penalty and you're looking at Obamacare. Who gets the other half? The other the other spouse? 
No. Have a working spouse? No, just half. Just okay, kid, so let's say independents are half of a person when it comes to Obamacare. If if I'm if, if there's a husband and wife couple, right, and they have it separate employers, so one of those uh, uh, the wife, let's say she get her employer covers her under Obamacare, the husband his he's covered under uh, under Obamacare. Is that double dipping? I mean, is that costing the taxpayers twice? Yeah, absolutely, because you're paying family coverage on both ends. Do they get 100% benefits, the dependents, though? The benefits get 100% of the benefits. Wow. And depending on the insurance, whoever's birthday is first is the primary insurance for that child. Wow. So now, a family of four, for the Obamacare situation, it's only three people. Right. Yeah. Oh, because of, okay. there's two halves. Two halves. Yeah. I got you. Okay. Wow. So I can do that math. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it simple like that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to come back in a moment to the Paul Montalongo Get a Grip Business Show because I want to now talk with Rob about, you know, what a, an employer needs to do to prepare for this because we're, what, three months, four months out now, something like that, right? Almost four, almost three months. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're coming right up on this threshold of time, uh, getting ready to walk through this door. And as employers and uh, entrepreneurs, we need to really be prepared for this. And we're going to cover that when we get back to the Paul Montalongo Get a Grip Business Show. Clear. Wow. But after a little bit? Huh? After a little bit? What do you mean? Was the aggressive with IRS stuff? No, 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 no. That's perfect, man. That's perfect. No, I mean, the, that was a wow. That was a good segment. Yeah, no, that was a good segment. The ins and outs of this, the nuance. Of, man, that's messed up. I, I mean, I had probably a 80% of the stand under this, you know? Right? Well, the knowledge is right? key. That's why it's great. And is that, okay, so it, 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 to if Bill Johnny is covered on both sides, information on right? that he gets 100% covered on one side. Knowledge that's the insurance coverage. The other half of the now there's the, that you provide the same coverage, maybe on one couple of the money for that same coverage. Now they have a premium refund code that's fixed your credit. But you don't use any type of call in premium. You can credit restoration now. That's 702-834-8150. That's 702-834-8150. Or visit AllianceCreditRestore.com. Log on now and get your free report. The 7.5 million dollars of credit repair. You did say that. What do you think this is going to work for part time? Because you know this is going to be a, a bit of a loss because a lot of people that work in this industry here, okay, are, we're, we're, we work full time, but we're considered a part time employee. When they work more than 32 hours, you're considered full time for both. And so, uh, full time in one location, right? One employer. One employer. One employer. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they work this you know, out here. Lotus Broadcasting owns all these stations, right? Lotus nine cross, stations in your town. You cross between nine stations. If you work 32 hours between the nine stations, right? You count as an employee. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Uh, get those guys off the radio. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, see, that's what, that's what some of the people are saying is that when you're certified, as, they're not going to stand by everybody. You know, we're going to get you a 29 out. So we're going we're gonna to go. Uh, Text me a note, too. Well, I got it. Just a second. Okay. I got it ready. Do you have anything home? Hogan. 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 Stand by. Likes are live. Welcome back to the Paul Montalongo Get a Grip Business Show. This is KLAV AM 1230, the talk of Las Vegas. We have in the uh, studio here Rob Wagner and, of course, my co-host Harry E. Shade. And we're talking about the um, uh, Health Care Act, the Obama Health Care Act. An interesting question came up during the break, and that is, what about part-time employees? How are they affected? What constitutes a full-time or part-time employee? Uh, and, and you know, how does that all fit into this Obamacare? Well, let's use the example that we did during the show, which is Lotus Broadcasting. We're going to have one major employer up here, and you're going to have nine different entities below it where sometimes the talent and stuff works in between 
the different, and we're just using Lotus Broadcaster because we're in this beautiful studio today. But yeah, thank you very much to, mm. to Lotus. Let me <laughs> yes. say thank you very much to Lotus Broadcasting for allowing me to have this radio show. It's yes. been really good. We'll see you after the show. We we'll get a call. Get those guys off the radio. <laughs> it's been fun. It's been fun over here. It right? was fun. So, but seriously, okay. Lotus is a is a, a company with nine stations. Yes. Right. Yeah, nine Lots stations. Of employees. And we were talking earlier that a lot of those companies that have stations underneath them or or companies underneath them. How do they determine what a full-time employee is? And that's if does that person work more than 32 hours in any of those nine companies? Because it's one paycheck, one W-2 at the end of the year. Okay. So yeah. So I mean, if you did even you know four hours here and four hours there, if that adds up to that 32, you're a full-time employee. Now, that, you know, here's the benefit: okay. a lot of employers are now going to hire more people. Part-time. Part time. Absolutely. Thirty one so hours or less. You double the workforce, reduce their hours to twenty five, it gives you a six hour play to work week, six or seven hours to play with That's another week. way to skin the cat. And employer. the problem is the wage base is gonna go down. And how is that gonna affect the economy? Well, it, it initially could put more people to work. Initially, yeah. You know, and when there's it's gonna be a matter of how the employer sees productivity in his or her company. Do you want do you want to, you know, ten people making a thousand dollars a piece, or do you want five people making two thousand dollars? Right, and it's and will those ten people do as efficiently and effectively and produce more than the five full timers, fully trained? I mean, both can be fully trained and fully operational, sure. right? Sure. But there, there's something about that, you know, that continuity of work that an employer has to really manage uh, when he thinks about one employer. Or excuse me, one employee versus two employees doing the same job. Now, if you're think about it, if you're sharing someone's desk, you go to sit down. You don't know yep. where left off on the project. Now, if you have those kinds of businesses that you know shift work is major, yeah. right? Shift work is a major component of your business. That might work. You know, go four days a week on shifts. Yep. yep. And you're and you're an employee for one or two days a week, and you're covered. So you said earlier that this all goes into effect January one, two thousand and fourteen. Here we are, almost September. Uh, you know, September of 2013, right? So Labor Day is coming up, and and uh, this one. Ironically, are, yeah, Labor Day, right? That's a good point. Way to go, Harry. All right, good job. <laughs> you know, so what did you keep him here for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a whole lot of reasons, right? Good guy. Um, so, uh, what does an employer need to do now? Because you can't just wake up on January one and, and be you know, hit the ground running. I would imagine. You need to do some things now to prepare for Health Care Act and it coming on, on board. What does the employer need to do now? What, what I've done with the employers that are inside my, pra inside my practice is I've gotten together and I've teamed up with ADP and we've started planning, actually started planning two years ago when this thing first started, of what we're going to do and how we're going to get everybody into place and put them in a position where by now the employer is already in compliance. Um, what you should do if you haven't done it yet is sit down with your tax professional get a real deep understanding of where you qualify because each individual employer is going to have very specific needs. Yeah, that would be you. Tax be professional. No, tax right. professional. Right there. That'd be I, me. I think it's perfect time for you to give us your contact information. Shameless self-promotion. Yeah, no, shameless. That's what, that's okay. what, you're a well-informed man. Let's, let's let the listeners know how they can get a hold of you. So yeah, you can go, uh, give my office a call at 564-1040 and that's 564-1040.com and then we can, uh, you can even make the appointments online. 1040. 564-1040.com. Imagine that. Absolutely. And then area code, area code 702-564-1040 because we have listeners all around the country. Oh, that's yep. right. And they can, all over the world. Even though you're in Nevada, you can service and help somebody that's in another state. Yeah, I have clients in all 48 states. This is a federal program. Yeah, wait, wait, what's wrong with the other two? <laughs> They're far. <laughs> Five, six, so let me do it one more time. Robert Wagner, 564-1040.com. Or his telephone number here in Las Vegas is 702-564-1040 for more information about the Health Court Care Reform Act. But so, is this going to affect, in your opinion, and this is opinion time now, is this going to affect, in your opinion, the growth of free enterprise overall? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. In a negative way? I think the economy will, will slow down because people are going to be so afraid of falling out of compliance and the penalties. and they're not going to run their businesses as they normally would without the big thumb of government over the top of their back. Right, that's why I think it's important that an employer 
an entrepreneur right now get himself or herself well informed on this, seek the advice of a tax professional, Rob or some, someone similar to Rob, so that you can get your business plan in play now. Additionally, in order to, if you have employees, you've got to give your employees a sense of security and safety so that they don't freak out on January 1, 2014. I say that you know kind of facetiously, but it is true that one of the key aspects of retaining good uh, quality employees is they need that safe, uh, safety and security and you know the communication. So as a responsible employer now, you need to have information so you can make good business decisions and so that you can communicate with your employees about this program. Well, now let's talk about the employees that are out there that are paying these premiums and they don't use 85% of the premium through the year through their health care. Yeah. And they get that refund of the premiums they paid in. The insurance company is now going to 1099 them for the premiums they didn't use. And and that's taxable income. Tax tax You're going to yeah. be added to more taxable income because you didn't go to the doctor enough. Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. We yeah, want people absolutely. to be healthier. We want them to not use these types of things, but we're going to penalize them if they don't use it. So, well, go get your checkups, endoscopies, go get your, you know, all those things that you need. Get, be healthy. You know, go there twice a year instead of once. Is it, you, what, what's your opinion? How do you think this is going to affect health care itself? The doctors are going to be seeing more patients, and they're going to be doing it, making right. less money per Per patient. Per patient. Per patient. It's per gonna drive. Now, the insurance companies are going to make more money. The doctors are going to make less money. And taxpayers are going to pay more tax on if they don't go to the doctor. And the state of health care is going to suffer a bit. And the state of health care is going to suffer quite a bit. Right. So, okay. Good news for us today here on the show. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's been a very uh, sunny Friday. I, but, but I, but I want to, I wanna, you know, just wrap it up by saying, uh, before we go into our last segment here, it's like great information. And I still believe that in, that enterprising professionals are going to figure out a way to manage this, to make it profitable, to manage their business, to make it beneficial for the employees, for their culture. It's going to take us a little time, I think. Until that happens, the economy and the general public is going to suffer. It's probably going to yawn a little bit, right? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Rob Wagner, for being here on the show today. And no, Paul Montalango, Get a Grip Business Show would be complete without the segment I call I'm Sexy and I Know It. This is the segment of the show where I reveal stories about people, places, celebrities, or businesses that relate to the free enterprise system or just pretty much anything I think in general that is sexy in the That's news. That's more like it. And uh, so in Toronto yesterday, Hulk Hogan visited Toronto and uh, he was challenged by Toronto's larger-than-life mayor, 307-pound Rob Ford, took, yeah, there you go, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> mayor Ford of Toronto, who is 44 years old, challenged Hulk Hogan to a friendly arm wrestling match, match to kick off an annual pop culture convention. Hulk Hogan, who is 60 years old, screamed out after the arm wrestling event, this was a setup because he got beat by Mayor Ford, 44 years old, who's 307 pounds. Hulk, baby, don't you know that you got to scout your competition first? All you Hulkamaniacs, don't cry. There's a lesson for, there's a lesson for all. Maybe Hulk was just a little bit uh, PO'd because his pre-divorce net worth was estimated at $30 million, and now, after his divorce, his net worth is estimated at some $5 million. I hope it was worth it, Hulk, baby. Next, uh, they are called super agers, men and women who are in their 80s and 90s, but with brains and memories that seem far younger. Researchers are looking at this rare group and hope that they may find ways to help protect others from memory loss. Now, 80s and 90s, that's some cool people. I know a bunch of those. Yeah, and absolutely. they've had some uh, tantalizing findings. Imaging tests have found unusually low amounts of age-related plaques, along with more brain mass related to attention and memory in these elite seniors. There's a study that's being sponsored. They're seeking volunteers. Interestingly, fewer than 10% of the participants have met the study criteria. But these super agers, the ones that they've found, they're not just different on the inside. They have more energy. They, have, uh, they share a more positive outlook, an inquisitive outlook. And so researchers are looking into what has contributed to these traits in these super agers. Are you volunteering? I am volunteering when it comes up to that in another 60 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> so super agers are sexy and they know it, right? That's right. Finally, last but not least, here's one for all of our lady listeners in the audience. 
Sexy man Ben Affleck has been cast as Batman for an upcoming movie role. And in preparation of the role, Affleck is working out two hours a day to train his physique. To just to just hone his, transform his physique, right? Like he wasn't already heartthrob, right? Now he's got to put all this pressure on the rest of us. And mm. with these millions of women, he has to go out and get buff. So good going, Ben Affleck. By the way, Affleck's net worth right now is estimated... At about seventy-five million dollars. Why can't they keep somebody to keep that role? What Batman? Yeah, they've had like why should like they? eight of them. Yeah, why should they? I, I mean, I, aren't you next? You just wonder. That's right. That's right. That's That's right. right. I'm I next. can't see Val Kilmer being Batman right now. I mean, the guy's old. Old. Yeah, I did, did that. Val Kilmer, Top Gun. He's old. He's old. <laughs> That's, old That's what I was just thinking about the volleyball. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't old in that volleyball scene. So I hear. Good. Anyway, <laughs> that's our show, folks. Right. Remember to see the replay at paulmontalongolive.com. I want to thank my guest, Rod Wagner. I want to thank my co-host, uh, Harry E. Shade. And remember to follow me on Twitter, at Paul Montalongo, and on Facebook, at Paul Montalongo Fan. And you can see the replay of the show at paulmontalongolive.com. As you know, it is my belief that the American free enterprise system is the best system in the world. Go out and make your spirit enterprise. Inter, uh, enterprise, an integral part of the American free enterprise system. It's the very best system, and above all, remember, go big or go home. That's our show for this week. See you next week. Bye, everybody. And we are out. We finish. Sure. Uh, about four minutes. Okay, four minutes. Oh, uh, oh I was a warning. Yeah, I was getting ready to pop the warning to you. Okay. Get some other commercials you can play. Uh, yeah, we'll do this. And then I think you said that. Uh... See you, folks. <laughs>